The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, The title of the message today is Walking a Revival Lifestyle. Now, as we're waiting for this outpouring that's coming to really get underway in fullness, I'll share a scripture with you. Revelation 19, 6 through 7. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And that caught my attention, that his wife has made herself ready ready that we need to take we need to be actively preparing not just waiting for something to fall out of the sky we need to get prepared in our hearts the dealings of God with us and a loose term that we hear a lot is the word revival actually revival revives the church which means there we are, the dead bones that are now rattling, that need the breath of God. We need the fire to fall. We need a revived church. And they say, as the church goes, so goes society. So a lot of things, that term revival is thrown around a lot. Um, But there are several terms for different nuances of revival. As I said, revival revives the church, and we need God in our midst. We don't need just teachings. We don't need religion. We need the presence of God. Now, a movement, on the other hand, restores lost truth. There was a prophetic movement that began in the 80s, and a company of prophets were raised up. There was a great healing movement in the 50s, where the truth that God heals today. There have been a teaching movement. There have been all sorts of movements because beginning at 1000 AD, God has been restoring truths that the church lost, restoring those things back so we can walk in them. And actually, uh, Bob Jones does a really good teaching on God restoring and what God has done and what's coming in the future as far as God restoring. And Bill Hammond has a book out there on the eternal church that traces through history the different movements. God prepares a person, God prepares a place, and God prepares a truth that's going to be restored and then releases that through the church. One of the movements that didn't exactly restore a lost truth was the charismatic movement. When I got saved, I entered into the charismatic movement. I didn't go to, uh, I went into all charismatic churches. And I remember one lady who was at one of the churches uh, who'd come up in the Pentecostal movement. And she said, wow, what you charismatics have done, you've restored joy into the church because it was, it was kind of like, I'm just a poor worm. She said, um, they were too serious. God likes joy. We should have a party when we come together in God's presence. So, and then God has had an apostolic movement where the truth about that apostles didn't die out. Jesus said that I gave apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists, and If Jesus gave something to the church, he's not an Indian giver, and he doesn't take something back once he's given it. So it's just that we leak. 
and we lose. <laughs> we lose truths. We lose understanding. But God is still moving today. Now then there's a reformation, the Protestant reformation, that that changes things in a drastic way. And a reformation touches society. And then in America in particular, of course, when God moves, it spreads around the globe. But then there have been two great awakenings so far. And an awakening does something even more profound. The first great awakening restored the first level of the cross. And there are three levels of the cross. There's the forgiven life, then there's the replaced life, and then there's the enthroned life a deeper work of the cross and the forgiven life was restored to the church during the first great awakening then in the second great awakening the truth that was released to the church is that of the replaced life galatians 2:20 i no longer live but it's jesus living in me i don't have to try to live the christian life i yield to him and allow him to live through me as me so the awakenings have restored the truth about the work of the cross. And first, we enter into the forgiven life when we realize that I'm a sinner and I need salvation. We enter into the second level, level when we realize I can't do this. It's too hard. I need Jesus living in me to live the Christian life. He is love. He is light. He is peace. I need him to be that in me. And then, of course, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within. We can access the riches of the glory within. And by the way, speaking of these different movements, revivals, reformations, Bob Jones said that the 2020s would be the decade of God's habitation. He actually called it the rest of God, where God rests in us and we rest in him. Well, that's a habitation where God doesn't just blow through as an influence. He comes and settles down and dwells. And then, of course, the um, verse that Dennis and I love so much, Ephesians 2.22, where God says, I will build you together together as a habitation, building believers together so God can come live in a community of a belie uh, in a community of believers, a house of God where Jesus does the building. And then in the 80s, Tommy Tenney wrote a couple of books, became, whoa, runaway bestsellers. The first one was The God, um, the God Chasers and the uh, next one was The God Catchers where we're hungry for the presence of God, like we were singing this morning, so hungry for the presence of God. And we have dry, dead religion. We have dry bones. We are dry bones, except for the presence of God. Now, Dennis, in his the early years of his pastorate, had some remarkable moves of God come through his church. These are like foretastes. And then we were doing our years of traveling ministry. We had um, an awesome time where God would show up at meetings and nobody wanted to do anything. People either wanted to lie on the floor, they slid out of their chairs. It was really awesome. And then we were asked to do a teaching where we were doing a teaching series uh, for eight weeks at a little church in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And we had taught this in Sturbridge. We had taught this in, was it New Haven? West Haven, West Haven, Connecticut. We taught it up in New Hampshire, Lowell, New Hampshire. And the churches would ask us to come. And one night a week, we would do a teaching. And we never were able to complete that teaching in Great Barrington, because lo and behold, before we got very much underway, the presence of God would show up. And it was really awesome, except then one lady asked the pastor, said, um, do you think Dennis and Jennifer could uh, wait 
had the, had the glory of God come down sooner because I have to go pick up my babysitter. <laughs> and, and we said, you don't understand. We're not doing this. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's interrupting our teaching. <laughs> Isn't that like God, like to interrupt what we think we're going to do? Well, what we're waiting for is a major interruption. I want, I want our schedules completely scrambled. I know when the Brownsville revival was taking place, they said, our lives are completely changed. Revival is all we do now. And that's what we really want. It, and it is all about Jesus. It is all about his presence, and we're supposed to be centered around him, not our ordinary activities or what we think we want to do. Now, the original day of Pentecost, where it all got started, was not just a revival. I mean, it was everything. It was a revival. It was a movement. It was a reformation. It was awakening, all wrapped into one. And it was maintained by discipleship and it lasted 100 years before a gradual decline set in. And then gradually from 100 A.D. to 1,000 A.D., truths that were known by the church were gradually lost. And, of course, what came out of that was Christendom, which was ceremony and rituals and gradual loss of the discipleship that had made the early church so vibrant. Now, Pentecost turned the world upside down because the Holy Spirit's rulership produced transformed lives of holiness and power. They didn't just go to church. They had an apprenticeship that they lived and they practiced, and it was 24-7. Now, since 1000 AD, we've had a number of amazing, I would call them Pentecostal outpourings, where they experienced what the believers experienced on the day of Pentecost, which was the Holy Spirit himself coming and taking over completely. This was the third level of the cross where we become co-workers with God. Jesus said that his father did the works in him, that he only did what the father, he saw the father doing. He only said what he heard the father saying. This was present your, <clears throat> excuse me, present your body a living sacrifice as Jesus presented him. And of course, you've heard this before, that we went through a period of time where it was like, God, this world's a mess. You need people through whom you can live because only you can clean up this mess. This is like when David faced Goliath. God, you come and do it. Let me be as surrendered so you can accomplish through me what you did through the early church. Now, since that time, there have been several other outpourings. There was the Moravian Pentecost, the Pentecost in Bangor Bay, Ireland, and both of those lasted 100 years before the power started to wane. The Wesleyan Methodists, in England, transformed an entire nation in one generation. They took England for God. In America, I know they give years for the Second Great Awakening, but the Second Great Awakening really began around 1771 when Francis Asbury, the Methodist uh, disciple of John Wesley, came to America, <clears throat> and it lasted in successive waves until the early 1900s. I mean, that is a serious time period, and it's fascinating to read about. <clears throat> Awakening moves out of church buildings and changes cities and nations. That's what we really want to do. Back in the 80s, I remember uh, people talking about taking our city for Jesus. But 
it happens on the inside of us and believers get out of the church walls and they take what they've received and it changes businesses, it changes government because Christians get elected. It moves, it's based on discipleship just like the early church. It takes that kind of believer. Now, to maintain a revival lifestyle once awakening begins, what are we going to do when the outpouring is poured out here? What are you going to do when outpouring is poured out in your city, in your state, in your church? Most modern day revivals have lasted only three or four years or so. Witness Lee said that revivals would take place in China and there'd be whole groups of people who'd pray for revival and the presence of God would show up in power. <clears throat> but people didn't let God do a work in their own hearts. And so revival would leave because God couldn't make a house there. Tommy Tenney made the point that God is looking for a place that's strong enough to support the weight of his glory. There's a work of preparation. The bride must make herself ready to be able to support what God wants to do. And I believe many of the outpourings, if people had been prepared and consciously prepared, that God perhaps would have stayed longer. It doesn't have to be like it was in China where the wind of God will blow through and then we'll be left unchanged. Goosebumps and excitement, a heightened sense of the presence of God, but then it wanes. Without a spiritual walk and inner transformation, Revival seems to fade and people lose the sense of the presence of God again. Now, the way of continuous revival. And there was a group in, the, in Central Africa under the leadership of C.T. Studd, the China Inland Mission. And he got upset because of the low level of Christianity practiced by the converts. I mean, they had many mission outposts that spread out from the central mission outpost, but he was unhappy with the way believers were living their Christian lives. They prayed in a Pentecostal outpouring, and it changed believers. I mean, this was a third level of the cross outpouring and the believers, just the way they lived and they were, made people believe just because their presence was there. They, it was Dennis talks about presence evangelism, where our mere presence will carry so much of the glory of God that people will say, what must I do to be saved? Or why are you so different? Just because of being around us and what we're emanating into the atmosphere. So this group in Central Africa in the mid-1950s did not want what was happening to ebb away. And so they took a, actually John Wesley, he, they were called Methodists because he had a methodical approach of discipleship, of prayer, of holding on to the presence of God. It was said that even in their small groups in England, it was though heaven itself would come down on those small groups. So he found some secrets. The son-in-law of C.T. Studd, how do we maintain it? You know, it's really good to ask questions of God. You know, like how can we keep this going or exactly what's going on now? I know Dennis, in his early years, was a question asker. And so I was impressed by this group in Central Africa. They found the way to walk a revival 
lifestyle, that walking a revival lifestyle was the key that caused the outpouring to be sustained. So I want all of us to get ready, to practice that, to be like the bride that prepared herself so that we won't leak away God's presence. So he won't say, well, they don't seem to want me anymore and lift his presence. Point number one, it starts by walking. Walking a revival lifestyle starts with walking. Now, walking defined is to advance by taking steps. And by the way, that's what the early disciples of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus did. In that day, most people who wanted to be um, tutored or mentored by a rabbi would find somebody that they were interested in and would say, can I follow you? Can I be one of your disciples? And in that day, they didn't have, most people just walked wherever they wanted to go. I mean, maybe there were some wealthy people who had carriages, some people who rode horses, but almost everybody walked wherever they were going to go. And so the disciples would enter into an apprenticeship and they would constantly be with the rabbi, that rabbis traveled from town to town so they would walk with their rabbi step by step. Now the Hebrew word for disciple is Talmud. So these Talmudim, the disciples, wanted to become not just somebody who had head knowledge, not just learned the instruction taught by their rabbi. They wanted to become like the person their rabbi was. Now, some, and it rarely happened, now some rabbis were recognized as having so much authority, so much spiritual insight, that they were able to give not just what they'd heard about scripture, but give new interpretations of spiritual truth. And these rare rabbis would seek out disciples and say, come, you, follow me. Brad, you, follow me. Vicki, follow me. Dawn, follow me. Each one of us have received a personal invitation from Jesus to come follow him, to walk step by step with him, step by step with our master, daily, hourly, moment by moment. It's simply a walk. And by the way, in the New Testament, almost every epistle starts with doctrine and concludes with how to walk it out. In everyday life, our walk never stops. It's moment by moment. Jesus is in us. He's with us. Every moment of every day, every step we take, everything we do, every thought we think. Now, the book of Romans lays out the entire pathway of the cross with the levels of the cross. But Romans 8, 4 tells us that the righteous requirement of the law, God's moral law, not the, not the Mosaic law, God's moral law, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It's the walk that's stressed. Galatians warns us, Galatians 3, 1 through 3, 5.16 and verse 25 says, O oh, foolish Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by your flesh? I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In Ephesians, we're introduced to glorious union with the ascended Jesus. 
Ephesians 4.1, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Ephesians 4.17, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. Ephesians 5.2, walk in love. Ephesians 5.8, walk as children of light. In Colossians, Colossians 2.6, as you have received Messiah Jesus as your Lord, continue to walk in him. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4.3 in the Amplified. Follow the instructions which you've learned from us about how you ought to walk so as to please and gratify God. In 1 John, we are taken to the very height of a spiritual walk. 1 John 2.6 he who says he abides in Jesus ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. That's pretty, that takes Christianity to the very height. This is what we're really called to. To walk is a step-by-step -step activity. To reach a destination, all that matters is the next step. Christian living, by the way, is concerned with the present moment. The present moment, step by step, the now, not the past or the future, only now. Whether we did well or messed up, the past is in the past. Now, we can learn from it, but it's not to influence our present step. Being upset with ourselves because of our poor performance or pleased with our successes, which, by the way, pleased with your successes, pride, um, is a self-effort mentality. We're to live yielded and surrendered lives and let Jesus simply live through us. Why do we imagine that we can walk in the spirit in our flesh? We are not going to be like the Galatians, okay, guys? Only Jesus in us can live the Christian life. Only Jesus living and walking in us can please God. And by the way, Jesus knows we're hopeless without him. Seriously. Why do we even imagine that we can do anything... About without him. By the way, in the Beatitudes, the first Beatitude is blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means it's not about self. We are rich only in the spirit of Jesus in us. Other than that, we have nothing. We can offer nothing. We can do nothing. Again, Colossians 2, 6, as you've received Messiah Jesus Continue to walk in him. If you stumble or give into temptation, receive forgiveness and keep walking. By the way, one of Satan's favorite weapons is condemnation, false condemnation. But again, if you think, I'm nothing, Jesus is everything, what can the devil condemn you with? Without Jesus, that's all I can do. I'm, I'm hopeless without Jesus. So I must have been trying in my flesh to do something if I feel condemned. Our past failures, the future, what does it matter? It, really, that um, song we sang this morning about God is with us. By the way, every single step. So why do we get into fear and worry about the future or feeling bad about ourselves for our past performance? And remember... Dennis teaches, fail, but don't be a failure because that's not your new creation identity. Brother Lawrence in the Barrels, one of my favorite stories. So Brother Lawrence was a monk who practiced the presence of God. One of the most famous little books in the entire Christian world is a compilation of letters that he wrote on practicing the presence of God. And he just loved God in everything he did. And he figured that without the grace of God, he would be a, he, that's where you're a failure, without the grace of God. 
walking in the old creation. And so one of his jobs would be to take a cart and take the barrels of wine that were produced by the monastery to the market. And he'd get to the market and half of the, say he took 10 barrels and five barrels had fallen off and broken and spilled the wine. And he didn't get upset with himself. That is pride. What do you expect of yourself anyway? He'd say, well, I got five there by the grace of God. Without the grace of God, I'd have broken all of them. It's so simple and freeing. Simply walk with Jesus. The next point, number two, walking a revival lifestyle requires brokenness. Now, this is not broken in a bad way, which means you're utterly destroyed or something. It's broken in the sense that a horse is broken to let the rider ride the horse. Dennis uses the term soul taming. It's about letting Jesus be Lord, letting Jesus be king, be surrendered to him. Broken is a key word for walking a revival lifestyle. Now, I heard a story once. It was hilarious. I am not a comedian, but it was a story of a, a fellow who went to a dude ranch. He was, this was a Christian minister who went to a dude ranch, right? And he had hardly ever been on a horse, so they gave him this old mare to ride, and he thought, oh, good, she'll be gentle. But as soon as he got on, she pinned her ears back, her eyes bulged out, she got the bit between her teeth, and then took him on a ride that he never forgot. Finally, he ended up being thrown and landed in a bush that somewhat cushioned his fall and just and got off with no broken bones, just a, a lot of scratches and bruises and very sore. The wild-eyed mare. Well, guess what? When Jesus picks, his at, picks us out, we're kind of like wild-eyed mares. And the Lord must start the process of taming us or breaking us. Now, in the Song of Solomon, the maiden who begins the journey um, is first compared to a mare in Pharaoh's army, which is a type of the flesh. Now, fortunately, this mare is somewhat trained. She's not the wild-eyed mare who just takes off. But whether we're a gentle mare or a wild-eyed mare, we still need our flesh broken so that Jesus can be the jockey. Jesus wants to be our Lord, our King, not just our Savior. And indeed, he should be. And this is the only way that we're going to be a place where God can come settle down and dwell. Now, by the way, there's a um, term led by the Spirit in the book of Romans. And that word led means to be completely controlled the way the person at the wheel of a ship controls a ship. Or today, the way a pilot controls the airplane. The ship and the airplane don't have a lot of say in the matter. And that's what God is looking for, people who don't have any say in the matter and simply say, yes, Lord. Unless we're broken, we'll never submit to a yielded walk. Unless we're broken, we'll take off doing our own thing like the wild-eyed mare. When pointed to the slain lamb, we need to break at the foot of the cross when looking at Jesus, what Jesus has done for us. And by the way, Jesus came and had a will completely surrendered to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the will of his Father. And he took upon himself the proud, unbroken, unbroken ego of fallen man. He was broken on Calvary in our place. What we deserved, he surrendered to. That's why when we look at him, we need to be surrendered to. 
Peter was broken the night he denied Jesus three times. The most crucial point, however, concerning brokenness and walking a revival lifestyle is realizing that Christian relationships are two-way, vertical with God and horizontal with our brothers. There's a wonderful little book called The Calvary Road by Roy Hessian, and he talks about that we can think we, me and God, we're doing pretty good here, but then put us in relationships with other people and they are not always cooperative, and they have a different personality, and they may not want to do things our way. And he talked about it's like people walking to, on spokes on a wheel, and the closer they get to the center, which is Jesus, the closer together they get. And you see the rough edges begin to be smoothed out, in relationship with other people. Horizontal relationships. Now, by the way, Carol Arnott had a dream. She was the wife of the pastor of um, the Toronto Revival. She had a dream, and I heard her tell it, and she was shaking as she told it. She had a dream of the time of the outpouring, and there was either light or darkness. And the people who submitted to Jesus came rushing to the light. But then there were people who were afraid of the light and went out into the darkness. That's kind of like Ananias and Sapphira. Um, great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. They took this seriously that when there is a great outpouring, when there's a great beginning of something, God is very serious about the people who were involved at the beginning because as the beginning goes, it will affect, because we're in community, we're in a church, we're influencing other people. God wants to maintain the purity of that thing. Kent Christmas recently said that in the past, God has shown himself as the God of mercy. However, now God is going to reveal himself as the God of justice. Now, we can look at things going on in the world and we can think, oh, there are people who've done bad things. They should be in jail. But guess what? Judgment begins in the house of the Lord that if we're going to draw near to Jesus, we need to walk this revival lifestyle. Point three, walking, a, oh, this is a good part. I mean, leave broken, brokenness behind. Walking a revival lifestyle leads to our cup running over. In 1 John 1, 1 through 4, the Apostle John talks about how wonderful it was to have walked the earth with Jesus and how amazing it was and what they've seen and borne witness to. They're now declaring to other people who will also believe. And he says in verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Why? that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. John was experiencing cups running over, a cup running over with joy and blessing. And David said in Psalm 23, 5, my cup runs over. It's overflowing. It's splashing out on other people. So we started with simply walking with Jesus. Then we touched on brokenness, being yielded. And now cups running over. When our cup is running over, we live in the abiding presence of Jesus with his peace and his joy and his presence 
filling us to overflowing with no shadows in between us and God, no shadows between us and other people. Nothing is breaking the peace and joy and fellowship with Jesus. No emptiness, dryness, fear or worry, which is sin, by the way, because remember, God is with us. Jesus is with us every moment. We're never alone. We're never without him. We're never without his assistance. But what stops the moment-by-moment flow? Well, the truth is only sin. You do know that worry is sin. Fear is sin if we take it in. Anything that causes our cup to stop running over is sin that we need to deal with. What are cups running over, if you want to define it a little more? It comes from the Spirit witnessing about Jesus in our heart, that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit, and we catch it. He's our peace, joy, and life. He never goes away. Anything that interferes with the Spirit, witnessing that and bubbling up from within us in our heart is something that's in our heart. We've let a shadow come between. Isaiah 59.2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you. Those shadows hide his face from us. How can we, oh, as that old song says, look full in his wonderful face. How can we do that if there's shadows in us? We're being separated. If our cup stops running over, if that bubbling up stops, then it's something we need to deal with. And Praise God, you don't have to go searching around. If you ask God to show you a sin or something wrong, he will be happy to oblige you. So when we see sin as sin and confess, the blood cleanses us and our cup overflows again. It really is simple. I won't say it's easy to live this way. But it is so simple. And we can't say that we're righteous before God when we're unrighteous with people. 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And we mentioned before, that dislike is simply a watered-down word for hate. And if we see more faults in a fellow believer and focus on that more than Jesus in them, we are in the wrong. So what should we do? Well, Jesus said to pray for your enemies. Bless them that curse you. It's tragic that there would be an enemy within Christianity, a fellow believer. So perhaps we should pray for someone if they see their faults. I remember uh, a wonderful little book I read on forgiveness that talked about maintaining unity in the church or in our communities with other believers by forgiveness and Oftentimes, the only way God can get us to pray for somebody is to have them offend us or say on the road, if somebody cuts you off, perhaps the way, that's the way God got your attention so that you will pray for them and not curse them. So often, so pay attention to the wrongs that are done to you, the things that hurt you, the people on the road that cut you off excuse me, off or drive 20 miles an hour in front of you. God is getting your attention. God is in control of every single thing that happens. Take that as a signal 
to pray. You see a fault in somebody? Pray for them. Love them with the love of Jesus in you. By the way, all we all tend to gloss over our own failings. So it's helpful to confess. The Wesleyans had accountability groups, so they would confess their faults one to another. It's so easy to let things slide if we're not sharing, opening up our heart to people. Um, it actually was a wonderful thing in the early Methodist church that allowed the power of God to rest upon them. Previously, we've mentioned this, that fallen man is like a house having a roof and walls, a roof on top of his sins separating him from God with walls between him and other people. Oh, how we are we pretend and hide and um, cover up what we really are. At salvation now, suddenly the roof comes off, our sin is exposed to God and to us, and the walls come down, and we stand before the world and God as a sinner who needed to be saved by grace. But soon afterwards, we start going to church and we want to be respectable. We want to be good Christians and look like good Christians. So often the walls start going back up because of our pride, our self-centeredness, um, us wanting to seem something more than we really are. Where we fail in our daily lives with impatience, temper, unkind thoughts, little acts of dishonesty, hypocrisy, those things we tend to hide from other people. So a group with people we trust, we can let the walls down. And you know what? What an opportunity to be fully known, warts and all, and fully loved by a small group of trusted believers. What a wonderful way to live. No pretension, just being real. Jesus, by the way, hates hypocrisy. He hates it when we pretend to be something we're not. Jesus exposed the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who pretended to be holy and righteous, saying, Matthew 23, 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Matthew 23, 27, Jesus continues on the same theme, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Let's get the walls down. Let's just be real. And by the way, the more real we are, the more open-hearted we are, the more unity we're in and the more the closer we grow to one another next walking a revival lifestyle point four requires walking in the light so now we've seen walking with Jesus walking in brokenness and walking with cups running over so well, when our cup doesn't run over then what we've learned only sin stops the inner witness but how do we know what the sin is? Close your eyes, pray, ask God, and guess what? It'll pop into your mind. It's that easy. Now in 1 John, verse 3 is speaking of the two-way fellowship. Fellowship with the Father and fellowship with other believers. Verse 4 speaks of that fullness of joy. Doesn't that sound wonderful? I mean, I don't know, but it gets bubbles inside of me bubbling up when I just say fullness of joy. Verse 5 contains a surprise. John now says he's going to give an inner truth about the Jesus with whom we walk. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
So we know God is love, but this is saying that God is light. What does light do? The obvious main function of light is to reveal things as they really are. You can't lie to light. Say you're walking around your house. Now, I have night lights everywhere, so this wouldn't apply to me very well. But suppose that you have everything dark in your house and you get up to get a drink of water or something at night and you bump into an object. You hit your toe against something and you say, oh, I must have hit the table. Well, guess what? Turn on the light and you might see a piano that you bumped into because the light has revealed the reality. Light shows you the truth. God is light. Silently, unfailingly, the Lord shines on us and in us, revealing things just as they are in His sight. In John 3, we're told that men are not lost because of their sins, because Jesus has taken care of that. He's made a remedy for sins. They're lost because they won't come to the light. John 3, 19 through 20 in the New Living Translation, judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. The only way any of us was saved was by responding to the light and saying about ourselves what God says about us. Our eternal destiny therefore hinges on whether we love darkness or come to the light. And how much more in this crucial time period we are now especially considering Carol Arn Arnott's dream that there will be many who will rush to the light, but many won't want to deal with their issues and sin, and they'll slink away into the darkness. Even as a believer, we can fail to come to the light. Actually, we have a choice every day, every step. Will we come to the light? Will we say the same thing that God says? Oh, that was an unkind thought you just had. An unkind thought. We don't even have to say it. And we can receive forgiveness. We can deal with it every single step. Now, we can, be a, we can walk in darkness if we choose, and I trust none of you will choose that. We can be a hypocrite and pretend we aren't in darkness. We can be self-deceived and say we have no sin. But it's honesty with Jesus moment by moment. The bottom line is that seeing sin requires revelation from God. Otherwise, we don't see it. It's God who reveals sin in us and who at the same time shows us the blood for cleansing. I mean, we've got the problem and we've got the solution right there together. How simple is it all? Now, all sin is ultimately against God, by the way. There is no, there's no victimless crime here. Sin is not just harming a brother, a brother or sister. It's not just an antisocial act or making a mistake. Sin is a perversion, by the way, of God's perfect design. We all bear the image of God himself. And when we sin, we mar that image. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. Sin is a big smudge on the mirror. It diminishes the beauty and the holiness that we were designed to reflect. We were created to be mirrors of the glory of God. So if we ask God to reveal sin to us, 
He will be oh so faithful to show us because he wants us conformed to the image of his son. He wants us conformed to his glory. And this is going to be an outpouring of glory and we're going to be mirrors reflecting that glory will be lights in the world wherever we go. Now, walking a revival lifestyle, this is point five, releases our testimony. Initial brokenness was roof off, walls down. Now, what about daily life after that? Roof still off, but what about the walls? Continued brokenness is, is continued revival. We're revived inside. This is the way to get revived inside of you, as well as how to walk in revival when the outpouring comes. Continued revival requires continued two-way testimony. We confess not only our sin, but our victories to one another. Because, see, it's not all just about dumping our sin out there on everybody. It's about testifying of the deliverance of Jesus, what Jesus did to set me free. That's our first testimony, is what Jesus did in me. Not Our testimony is not that I'm a sinner. It's Jesus is my deliverer. This is what he did. And what this Jesus did for me, he'll do for you too. We confess our victories to one another. We don't let our small groups or our, our um, confessing to people weigh the, on them and wear them down and make them feel heavy, that we end up with rejoicing over who our Jesus is and what our Jesus has done. The confession that really matters is confessing Jesus rather than sin. We're called to continually testify about Jesus. It's our duty. It's our privilege. I was struggling with this, fill in the blank, but Jesus did this and delivered me. We share with others what wonderful things Jesus has done in our lives. We glorify God by testifying to his fresh deliverance. Our testimony releases blessing into the atmosphere. We're not only confessing sin, we're praising God for what he has done and giving others the chance to praise God with us. Testimony does one thing more. When others share what God has delivered them from, it convicts us of our own sin. It touches hidden spots in our own heart. We find freedom and add our testimony. It ignites heart after heart with fresh zeal and love for God. That is how great revivals break out. Sure, there's repentance. Sure, there's repentance first. But it's the gladness and the freedom and the joy and the praising that leaps from heart to heart. Someone sees sin, someone breaks down in brokenness. They don't care who's in present. Conviction spreads until dozens are doing the same thing. And we're praising God and his presence falls on us. Revival has broken out and God is glorified. Now, how do we maintain revival so that it doesn't fade? One, simply walking with Jesus. Step by step. Two, walking in brokenness, surrendered to our Lord. Three, walking with our cups running over with peace and joy bubbling up in our hearts. Walking in the light, getting real with God and getting real with other people. And then walking with a ready testimony, always willing to share that others may praise and glorify God. This is the secret to walking a revival lifestyle. Let us go forth and practice. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.